Hey, this is CND Channel. I'm Chris. This is MMA for you. I'm going to be doing my post fight analysis for UFC Fight Night 57. Overall, good card. Um, it was pretty much what a fight night should look like. Good prospects, a couple top fighters, um, a couple fun action fights here and there. Some not so great fights, you know, but that's fine. Overall, I thought it was a solid card. Definitely what a fight night should look like. My picks, not too bad. Got 8 out of 12. The ones that I missed were um, Roger Nervais versus uh, Luke Barnett. Um, Akbar Ariola versus Eve Edwards. Alexei Olenek versus Jared Rochalt. And Chico Camus versus Brad Pickett. Got all the other ones correct, though. Uh, bonuses, Frankie Edgar and Alexei Olenek. Got performance of the night bonuses, while Van Zant versus Curran got uh, fighting night bonuses. Uh, not much to note in this card. I mean, pros some prospects look really good. Uh, there was some questionable judging with the James Vick fight. Um, just in a 30 27 scorecard there. Uh, otherwise, it wasn't actually too bad. Um, there was a scorecard for Brad Pickett, like 30-27, and then Chico Camus getting like 29-28, uh, two scorecards, which is a bit odd because like that type of discrepancy, you know, it's like one guy totally shot for Pickett and another guy like two other guys didn't, you know, didn't even give it like 29, didn't even give Pickett a round, it's pretty interesting. Um, Otherwise, nothing too egregious, uh, to be honest with you, as far as judging goes. Um, finish, you know, the finishes were good when they had some. Um, and, you know, like, you know what, let's just get to the card. Frankie Edgar defeated Cub Swanson by uh, submission in the fifth round. It was like a rear naked choke, but I think it was more of a crank slash, like, skull jaw crush. Um... I believe that, from what I heard, Cub was saying, uh, oh yeah, Cub said on FS1 that Frankie had landed a lot of elbows to his jaw, and his jaw was tired, quote unquote. And when Frankie sunk into choke, Cub's mouth was open and he didn't want a broken jaw. Uh, I've been there before and I don't want that to happen again. So, um... Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a rear naked choke. I know some are billing it as such. I, I think it was like a, more of a crank type move. Uh, more of a squeeze, just like a, a squeeze to the jaw type move. Still got the victory. There are only four seconds left in the fight out of five rounds. Um, This actually sparked a lot of debate in the MMA community, just in general. Of who should get the next title shot? A lot of people are saying if Conor McGregor beats Dennis Seaver, he should get it because he's a fresh challenger. Frankie Edgar has already lost to um, Jose Aldo not too long ago, like two years ago. And of course, Conor McGregor is going to be the more marketable fight against Jose Aldo. You know, on the other side of the coin, Frankie Edgar, dominant performance over Cub Swanson. McGregor's best win in the division is Dustin Poirier. Uh, Cub Swanson is ranked higher than Dustin Poirier. And Cub Swanson has also beaten Dustin Poirier. And Frankie, yeah, you know, I know there's some MMA math there. There really isn't supposed to be, but ranking wise, Frankie has beaten a guy that's higher up the ranks than the best guy that McGregor has beaten. Um, in featherweight, in featherweight. Uh, the other wins are kind of ancillary. I mean, you're talking like McGregor beating Brendel. Max Holloway, I mean, in hindsight, it's a really good win. But during that time, I don't know if it was that strong of a win, um, as it would be now. Um, you know, he beat him, he beat Brimage. So... Whereas, like, Frankie Edgar, I mean, yeah, BJ Penn, not, it's a name, but not that great. But beating Charles Oliveira, that's pretty strong right now as well. 
So, and, and of course, some people are saying that, you know, the Jose Aldo fight was pretty close. You know, and maybe that should give Frankie some merit here as well. Um, tough to say, you know, it, it just depends on, hey, like, you know, Connor's resume is enough to warrant a title shot as it is. He beat a top 10 guy in Dustin Poirier. And that usually warrants a title shot. Frankie Egger just beat a, a top a top guy. I think Swanson might even be like top five. You know, I would argue that Frankie, like like I said, I mean, facts are facts. You know, I, I will, if I'm not mistaken, Cub Swanson's higher up the totem pole than Dustin Poirier. And in that sense, Frankie Egger should get the title shot. But once again, there's other factors at play here. Business-wise, McGregor's better for business. He'd bring more interest to the fight, and he's a fresh challenger. As far as the fight goes, man, you know, after that first round, ah, uh, gosh, that was just all Frank Yeager dominant performance. To the point where I think Cub Sweat said something to the likes. I think uh, Brian Stan was saying that he said like, "Thank you for making me a better fighter" or something like that. He like. I think he also even said words like afterwards and like different interviews and stuff like he, he exposed me you know and, and stuff like that so he was pretty you know he, he pretty he took the Cub Swanson took the loss uh, with class you know but the fight I mean this was all Edgar grappling and wrestling and just ground and pound and just some great stuff here I would like to uh, point out the first thing, his chaining of takedown attempts. Not For one, it's his timing. When Edgar missed one takedown, he'd go for a different type of takedown. One time he like missed a single, went for a trip, go for the double, get the, he'll get the waist lock, you know, miss the double, go transition to the waist lock. I mean, just... So many, so many like transitions in the actual wrestling and just getting the fight to the ground. Once he was on top, I have never seen Frankie Edgar so heavy on top. I was actually uh, on the broadcaster saying that he was just awarded his black belt. Um, some positions I like when he's on half guard, just having the um, is it the cross face? I think they call it the cross face. A few of different terms for for some of the moves. Or when he had like a cross face, even with just one arm and had a free arm, and ha when he was on top and half guard, he could just pound him out. When um, the few times that Swanson managed to scramble, like Edgar would take his back. I mean, you can definitely see he's not just a wrestler, you know. Like you can act, like I can see the positional awareness. I, he was already really good, you know, at on the ground. Now he, he, he looks just fantastic. I mean, like I said, I never seen him look so heavy. He was on Swanson like glue, but not laying praying. He was either gra uh, ground and pounding or trying to pass the guard or what. So I know Jimmy Smith likes to call, uh, he's the Bellator commentator. Uh, pound to pass where you ground and pound and use that to pass guard um, Edgar was doing all that and was just totally active from rounds two to five and always looking for that finish too uh, hitting different parts of the body too actually there's one point where he was kneeing the body from half guard from side mount elbows and punches to the head there was a lot to like in here I, there was um you know, if if you even if you just like like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, there's actually little things you can see in this fight that I I, I thought were pretty cool. Um, you know, even from Swanson, he actually from half guard, um, he did this one where he got the arm and the other one made a made a frame. I mean, but it was over over his arm, which is kind of cool. I can't really describe it. And then he pushed up the scramble. I'll probably use that myself. Uh, I, I do get stuck in half guard on the bottom against heavy guys a lot of times. 
Um, so I'll, I'll probably use stuff like that. Um, and that was from Cub Swanson, <laughs> you know? Uh, just from Edgar, just uh, using the crossface really well. Uh, the types of passes he'd do, he, he would, you know, he'd get in full guard once Swanson opened up his legs. If he had a, a Swanson had a foot on the hip, push down on the leg, transition to half guard. Get the cross face, maybe do some pounding, ground and pound and whatnot. And then he'd actually trend, um, one thing that he made that, he made Swanson do is make his shoulders get his flat on his back. He's never on his side. And um, the other thing he'd do is to get quarter guard and uh, uh, and to to mount. He would uh, so your back is totally flat on the ground, but his legs would be kind of like flat. Um, I can't really describe it without showing it. But he'd do that, and then he'd be in a quarter guard position, and then from there he can pass the mount. I see pass. I like to do. Um, so there, there's a lot to like, actually, that to say the least. If you're looking, like you know, uh, I was actually with one of my friends at uh, it's a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and um, you know we actually fast forwarded a couple things like, oh look what this guy did, you know? hey look what this guy did, you know. So it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty basic, actually, but I, I love the basics because it's it's the most effective thing that I notice. Um, but I mean, it's just fundamentally sound and it works, you know. So there was a lot to like out of this uh, out of this performance. I, I liked also when Edgar was in mount. Um, Swanson would either try to um, sit out. I, I guess I don't know if that's called a sit out. No, nah, it's not really a sit out because the wrestling sit out's a little different. But um, pretty much like do a crunch, like one big like um, one big crunch to kind of get out of mount. I want to to give up his back, but Edgar was on him like glue the whole time. He, he was aware of it the whole time. So I was I was very very impressed with what I saw from Edgar. And, and uh, you know, like I said, if you're looking for like. Like me, I like the technical aspects of stuff. I, I am a practitioner of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, boxing, and Muay Thai. So, uh, seeing the, some little things that were going on um, on the ground, I mean, it, it just looks like, oh, he's just in half guard. Oh, he's just pounding him out. Oh, he's just, you know, oh, okay, well, that just opened up for, you know, he opened his legs, therefore he's mounting him. It, it, it's a little more intricate than that. Um, I tried my best very badly to, to explain what he was doing, but um, there was a lot to like there actually. Um, with that said, um, Frankie Edgar, uh, if you want to give him a title shot, I mean he, you know, this win warrants one. If not, I mean a lot of people are thinking that Conor McGregor is probably going to get the next title shot. So, uh, guys coming off a big win, uh, Ricardo Lamas would probably be a really good fight against Frankie Edgar. If not him, um, I know, uh, Chad Mendes and Frankie Edgar, I mean, that, that fight's been planned a couple times, just never fell through. Um, that's a really good fight, too, as well. With Cub Swanson, uh... You know, I know they don't do losers and winners, but I, that doesn't usually... That's not usually the case if the guy who's losing comes off of a tight you know uh a title fight so if you want to do swanson mendez that's another fight i think that's always been talked about but never actually happened i think the more appropriate fight for cub swanson would be uh dennis bermudez he's coming out the went lost to ricardo lamas uh next fight after that edson barboza defeated bobby green by unanimous decision uh, one of the big stories of this fight really is just on Green. One, he um, contemplate. He, he was actually talking about retirement. There's there's a lot of turbulence in his personal life right now. Um, so you know, a lot of stuffs going on outside the cage with the guy right now. Uh, as far as what's that, what happened in the cage, I mean, same in the Josh Thompson fight. Just the amount of talking and taunting from Green was 
in my opinion, a bit off-putting. Um, Barboza didn't really... F I know they're saying, like, oh, he's doing that to get a reaction from the guy and whatnot. Barboza wasn't mighty <laughs> at all. I mean, uh, this was one of the better performances from Edson Barboza. And, and he show they showed a little more growth here. Um, so it's, uh, they're actually talking about his trainers... Uh, I know he's out of Ricardo Almeida's gym training under uh, some, you know, with Frankie Edgar. I think Marlon Moraes trains out of there as well. Talked about some of the uh, coaches and stuff. I actually liked uh, Barboza's movement here. He, he he can be a bit flat-footed sometimes. I, I notice a lot more movement here, which is interesting because when I was thinking about this fight, um... Bobby Green was actually, from what I've seen from his fights, is a guy that utilizes a lot of movement. So seeing Barboza, you know, pretty much like out, you know, like do better with the footwork uh, than Green was pretty surprising, actually. I was actually thinking Green would um, be the more lateral moving type of guy. And utilizing his boxing with his movement. That wasn't the case. Uh, Bobby Green did show a really good chin. He got dropped or wobbled or dropped. I forgot by a, a really big punch. I believe in the second. And then took a pretty much flush uh, spinning heel kick. It kind of hit the back of the head here. So I kind of wonder if it actually hit just like the foot here. Like or you know like you know, more towards, like, straight at the chin if it wouldn't have just knocked him out. I wonder if it just got more of, like, the leg, which is still really strong. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Um, I, but nonetheless, he, he took it, you know, Bobby Green just took it and took a lot of what Barbosa had to offer. He, he actually showed... Barbosa was hitting some good power strikes on Green. Um, but, yeah, this was actually just one of the better performances from Barboza. Uh, Bobby Green briefly got that. You know, he caught a kick, took down Barboza. Barboza, he, like, throws an out kick and just scrambles his feet. Which goes to show, even if you take... He's hard to take down as it is. And even if you take him down, he's hard to keep down. Uh, still showed the kicking game. That's, um... Uh, trademark of his style. But uh, he was also doing a couple slip counters as well, so you know, uh, with his hands. Um, so I kind of liked what I saw. They're, they're, they're small improvements, but they're improvements nonetheless. I liked more the movement. I think that was a much bigger improvement than I saw out of Barboza. And, and so I really liked what I saw from, uh, from him in this fight. Um, I think Barboza should get the winner of Masvidal versus Park or El Iaquinta uh, next. Uh, Bobby Green, if he decides to keep fighting, the loser of Masvidal versus Park or Ross Pearson next. Next fight after that, Chico Camus defeated Brad Pickett by split decision. Um, Camus was doing something of a like. Like a Dominic Cruz style, hands down, lots of movement. They didn't really work very well, though, I gotta say. And also, Brad Pickett was kind of making some adjustments. He was uh, ducking, and you do a duck counter a lot of the times on Camus. It was a close fight, though. I mean, I, I thought it could have gone either way. Um, scorecards were interesting, though, because one judge gave it 30 27 to Pickett, and then Chico Camus, the other two judges, gave him uh, 29 28. Um. Wait, I guess that's not so confusing. Uh, yeah, because that means they gave one round to pick it. Ah, I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I, 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 earlier I just said that that was kind of confusing. Now, yeah, if it was 30-27 on both sides, I would, um, I, 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 it would be confusing. Ah, jeez, I... My bad. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, give us a good against Pickett. I think it, it speaks more for Pickett's decline than Camus looking particularly good. I always thought Camus was a solid fighter, you know. Stand-up's good. He, he's a good on the ground. He's a good scrambler. You know, he scrambled with guys like Kyung Ho Kang and whatnot. Um, Stand-up's not too bad. I think he's training back with Rufus Sport. 
You know, his stand-up's not too bad as well. Um, I get. It looks like he's gone for a a different style here of stand-up. Um, you know, so it was a good performance uh, against a solid enough opponent. Brad Pickett's got like two losses in a row now. He he needs to get a win. Um. And it's, you know, it's the one thing they used to Ian McCall, and now you're losing to Chico Camus, you know, who's not even ranked. Um, you know, he, he, at this point, you know, they, they should probably just give Pickett some lower to mid two guys. Same with uh, Camus, to be perfectly honest with you. I mean, this was a good win, but uh, I think it was really close. I, I can't really say too much about where Camus is at. He looks like a mid-level guy right now. Um, and they should probably just give him more mid-level fighters at this point. Next fight after that, Alexei Olenek defeated Jared Rochelt by knockout in the first round. Devastating knockout and very surprising too. I, I thought, you know, some fights here were kind of locks. Duhu Choi versus Juan uh, it's, not, it's Poog. I think it's Poog, right? Something like that. I thought that was uh, kind of a lock. Um, Benavides versus Ortiz, I, I figured was a lock. And if there was a third fight that was a lock, I thought it would have been this one, to be perfectly honest with you. I thought Rochelle would just utilize his wrestling game, neutralize Olenek a lot of, you know, get the ride position when he can, uh, and get a you know, grinding victory like he normally does. It's kind of surprising, uh, you know, in a sense, because uh, Rochelle was doing very well early. He actually got a clinch, and he started to, like, uppercut, and I like, can get a couple of knees and whatnot uh, against a cage. Uh, it, it really goes to show that Rochelle's striking needs a lot of work. I mean, Derek Lewis managed to knock him out, too. He leaves a lot of openings in his stand-up. He's not very quick there. He's very quick in his wrestling and whatnot and transitions um, on, in the grappling department, but he's not, very, he's not a quick striker at all. Um, I mean, he obviously doesn't look the part, but, like... You know, if you compare his wrestling to his striking, it's like, you know, he's quick at wrestling. He's not, for his size, he's not quick at striking. I mean, um, so it, some guys just don't pick it up uh, very well, uh, too. So, granted, that much as well. Um, but, yeah, you know, they're heavyweights. I mean, they, they both, you know, heavyweights hit hard. Rochelle was just knocked out cold follow-up hammer fist uh, and Olenek got the victory there um, at Olenek's age though it's one of those things where he's pretty much I mean he's like what 38 he's even fought at light heavyweight at times so um, you know I, I don't make much exaggerations for what he is uh, he's something of a gate a really good gatekeeper for heavyweight you know he can Beat the Jared Rochelts, you know, the Alexander Hamilton, or is it Alexander Hamilton? Is that his name? I oh, know it's Hamilton. Hamilton, um, you know, like UFC newcomers and prospects. He's a good test for those type of guys. You know, he's been around the game uh, for a long time. You know, he, he's he he's been there with a lot of fighters. Um. So with that said, I mean, if you want to give him someone kind of high out there, you go Olenek versus Rothwell. I'm thinking more use him more as a gatekeeper type uh, role. Uh, Ruslan Magomedov, who's coming off the win over Josh Copeland, would work. Or maybe the winner of Duffy versus Hamilton. If, if Duffy, uh, actually, scratch it. If Duffy beats Hamilton, I'd go with Duffy versus Olenek. With Rochelle, uh, he can get the loser of Duffy versus Hamilton. Or he can get, like, Josh Copeland. The problem with Rochelle is that, like, despite this loss, like, I can't help but think if he wrestles, he can just beat most lower to mid-tier heavyweights anyway. So it's kind of, like, I don't know if you need to give him, like, 
a lower level guy per se. I mean, I guess you can give him someone still high up there. Um, cause I, I I I get the feeling he'd be if he uses his wrestling, he'd probably beat most mid to lower level heavyweights. That's the thing. Uh, unless they can defend his takedowns or something like that, and be up on defeat. Uh, next fight after that, Joseph Benavides defeated Dustin Ortiz by unanimous decision. Um, fun fight. Uh, this was actually my. I know that Van Zant versus Current got fight of night, and that was a really fun fight, especially that first round. But I kind of uh felt that Benavides versus Ortiz was a, a better fight. Um. And I bet there's just a little more higher higher level stuff going on here, and also is active the whole time. It's a little more back and forth. Like Ortiz was always in the fight, you know, um, at the very least. But Benavides was just a better wrestler, better scrambler, better striker. Ortiz ate a lot of what Benavides thrown at him. Uh, one thing that we were, uh, me and my friends were observing with Benavides, especially when he'd flurry a lot of times, is that when he threw a punch a lot of times, um, he would kind of hit with this, you know? Um, he wouldn't, like, hit th with the knuckle. Like, sometimes he'd kind of, like, paw. So that was really interesting. I wonder if that's something uh, that he can fix, because I wonder if that, that would actually have made a difference and if you watch closely, you can actually see that a lot. He kind of does this, like, paw type of, uh, this pine st style punching, uh, during some of his flurries, instead of really hit with the knuckles. Um, so, but nonetheless, I mean, he's beating up Ortiz a lot, uh, so, and I kind of just was better everywhere that Ortiz was good at. Um, but Ortiz was hung tough. The guy's got a really good chin. He's always pushing forward. He, he's, he's a tough out for just any flyweight, really. Um, definitely one of those type of guys that a new prospect might want to avoid. But both of these guys are actually kind of like that. Um... Nonetheless, I think Benavides versus Dodson would make sense. Get the winner of that. Uh, Demetrius Johnson. I don't know when uh, Ali Bagay Tunov is coming back. But uh, he'd be an another good fight for Benavides as well. Just guys who have already fought the champion would be uh, really good. Like, don't get Benavides like Horiguchi or like. You know, maybe not even like a form. Don't give him like Formiga. Oh, he already. Formiga already lost him. You know, um. These guys like that. So Ortiz, um. Give him something like a Makovsky or something like that. You know, they're so good fights for him. Um. Yeah, I think like. I think Makovsky's already fighting someone. I just totally forgot who. Um. That's some people that are kinda up there, you know. Give that, uh, give that to Ortiz or um, you know, you can even go with like either one of these guys can fight like Wilson Hayes or something like that. He's coming out to win over Scott Jorgensen. That'd be fine as well. Next fight after that, Matt Wyman defeated Isaac Valley Flag by unanimous decision. Valley Flag's biggest problem was really working in Wyman's wheelhouse. You know, I mean. The parts that Valley Flag would lose was when he would go for his own takedowns, get his back taken, like, almost every time, <laughs> you know, when he failed, when Wyman would hit the switch or something like that, and, you know, get his back taken. There, there was, the fight, I remember this fight being very, very much an inside fight, lots of elbows were utilized. But it really was the grappling of Matt Wyman that made the difference of this fight. It's a good return for him. Isaac Valley Flag's a tough out. And he's a guy that's always going to be in her face for the whole 15 minutes. He's got a really good chin. On a technical level, he's not very good. <laughs> Quite honestly, he's, just, he's very much kind of a brawler, dirty boxing type. Um, not a great wrestler, not great on the ground or anything like that. It makes the most of what he has. 
Uh, the problem is he's on like this really big losing streak now, so he should probably get cut from the UFC at this point. Uh, Wyman, though, just more low, uh, mid to lower tier guys of the division for him. You know, he's always in you know, good fights and whatnot. So yeah, it's more lower to mid tier guys of the division for him. Got on the FS1 prelims, Ruslan Magomedov defeated Josh Copeland by unanimous decision. Um, so much to say, you know, Copeland was kind of, he, he seemed very raw, whereas like, I think he had a moment in like the second or third, but otherwise, Magomedov has a lot more diversity in his striking, especially his lead left kick is just really strong. It's hard to take down as well. And, um, yeah, you know, he throws in combination. I think what Brian Stan was saying, that's a big problem with Mega Metoff, is he gets uh, kind of complacent to the point where he just wants a counter strike. Doesn't really take the lead. Um, but otherwise, th there's a lot to like out of Mega Metoff. He's still young, especially for heavyweight. Um, I mean, he's not mid 20s. He's like, I think he's like 28, which is. For heavyweight, I mean, you can be a prospect at, like, your mid-30s. <laughs> it's just the way it works. Um, you know, he strikes in combination. Te strikes technically well and has a good... But these guys actually have some decent cardio for heavyweight. I mean, they weren't, like, totally gassed out by the third round or anything like that. Um... So yeah, I, I really like what I see out of Magomedov. I think he should get Olenek or the winner of Duffy versus Hamilton next. Copeland, just more lower to mid-tier guys at the division. There's some promise for him, you know, he trades out a grudge. He's a good boxer, you know, good dirty boxer when he... Um, gotta wonder if he can actually make the cut to 205, if that's possible. Uh, if not, you know... Um, there's, still, there's good fights for him at heavyweight, nonetheless. Next fight after that, Roger Narvaez defeated Luke Barnett by split decision. I liked what I saw out of Narvaez here. Uh, the, the things I've seen from Narvaez really is um, takedown and ground and pound. Actually, in the third round, he showed a good, some really good uh, ground and pound on Barnett. But uh, he was showing some uh, better striking in this fight. He's big for the weight class, too. Barnett's 6'6", six, six, and I think Arvidas is like 6'3", or something like that. Um, I liked what I saw from him, to be honest with you. Uh, and he fought Patrick Cummins and, and just looked like a guy that would probably be bounced from the UFC, but now he... You know, I, I wouldn't say he's much uh, like this great prospect or anything. I think he's like 30 or 31, too. I'm not... And I need to double check that actually. Um, but you know, he looked like a pretty solid fighter that definitely has staying powers in the middleweight division for sure. Two losses in a row for Luke Barnett. Uh, you know, he trains. He's trained at Alliance, and I I saw that in this fight. One thing about his style back then was that he was more of a plotting fighter, but threw a little more power in his strikes. Alliance, they're more movement based, volume striking, but like they don't always have that power in their striking. Um, you know, they prefer volume to power in a sense. I kind of saw that with Barnett here, you know, um, I, that he was kind of adjusting to a new style. Um, didn't necessarily work out for him. He, you know, you're turning a plotting guy into like a movement heavy fighter. It's it's gonna take some transition here. But he's on a two fight losing streak. Both of them are by, you know, uh, th there's definitely arguments for Barnett winning this fight. And, and I thought he beat Sean Strickland in his last fight. So they're contentious split decision victory or losses. But nonetheless, it's two losses in a row. He's still only in his mid twenties, and I, I want to say he only has like ten fights or so. So he's still a prospect, um, but he just there's stuff that he just needs to work on. I I don't know how else to say it. Just maybe work on it. You know, 
working on his range game and his distance game more maybe or something. Uh, there's just something that needs to be tweaked with him. He's a good fighter, um, but there, there's something that's just missing that's taking that's stopping him from getting to like that next level and, and consistent victories uh, in the, the UFC middleweight division. Both these guys should just get more lower to mid two guys of the division. Next fight after that, James Vick defeated Nick Hine by unanimous decision. Well, James Vick did not deserve that 30-27. 29-28 is fine. I thought this fight could have gone either way. Personally, I had it for Hine, rounds 1 and 3, but uh, I can see the argument for James Vick, rounds 2 and 3. Uh, Hine, for sure, in round 1. I mean, the guy dropped Vick twice, so I don't understand how Vick can get a 30-27. Vic's really tall for the weight class. He's a real resilient guy. Um, still a guy that gets hit really clean. You know, you can definitely see that he's still very raw in MMA. But he's really tricky too, especially with his height and with his durability. Um, his boxing's not too bad. Or sometimes he would uh, he'd strike and uh, angle out really well um, at times. You know, um, but yeah, you know, the, the thing with Vic is he's just that guy that keeps surprising you because he's not always the most technical guy, but he's a very tricky fighter. I don't know how else to say it. Um, for both of these guys, it's more lower to mid two guys of the division, really. Uh, with Nick Hine. I don't know if he's planning to go to featherweight after this. I'm kind of curious um, if he's trying, planning a, a featherweight run. I, you know, he's striking. His cardio looked a lot better than his last fight. Um, he's got that judo, which he didn't really get to use on Vic. And he does p hit pretty hard. Um, I didn't really call him much of a prospect, but he's a solid fighter nonetheless. Next fight after that, Akbar Ariola defeated Eve Edwards by armbar in the first round. This was sad, man. This was real sad. Picked Eve Edwards to win. Big fan of him, but uh, I think he should retire, personally. I mean, it's not up to me, obviously. Uh, only Eve Edwards should know when or when not to retire. But when you're losing to the likes of, I mean, he can, he can still find in the regional scene. It's obvious he can't fight on the UFC level anymore. I mean, Akbar Ariola is not that great of a fighter, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. Strikes kind of funny. It's good on the ground. Um, got that really good uppercut on Eve Edwards, you know. And Eve, you know, back in the days, probably wouldn't fall for some of that stuff and, and would probably beat Akbar Ariola pretty easily. These days, his chin just isn't there. Um, you know, it, it it's just it's just not there anymore. You know, I mean, he's losing to lower level guys. What what can I say? He got armbarred. You know, very traditional armbar. You know, got mounted and then armbarred. Didn't really seem to fight it too. I think he was kind of wobbled. Not you know, granted, he's kind of wobbled. But yeah, and then this was a lot of losses too. You know, so um. Not looking good for Edwards here. Uh, he, I would bet that he gets cut from the UFC. Wouldn't surprise me to hear him retire pretty soon, to be perfectly honest with you. Akbar Areola, you know, he gets the same to the UFC. That's all I can really say. He's just fight more lower-level guys of the division. Okay, on the fight pass prelims, pretty good, too. Paige Van Zant defeated Kenley Kern by a Tika in the third round. I've actually seen a good amount of Paige Van Zandt's fights, uh, actually. Um, I knew that she's really aggressive about getting takedowns and just kind of getting into clinch. Uh, she's still not the greatest striker. She doesn't have a very, like, technically sound game, but y you can tell she's only 20. Um, that she's definitely got potential. Uh, she did eat punches trying to initiate clinch, which wasn't very good. 
uh, on Van Zandt's part, but she took him like a champ and uh, got the clinch, bullied Curran against the cage. Sometimes she'd get taken down, um, uh, especially if uh, Curran got the wizard uh, and would go for like a, jeez, what are those guessing ties or like a judo style takedown? I I don't know the names of judo style takedowns, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, you know, it, it was just I liked the improvements I saw from Van Zandt. Uh, preferably her dirty boxing game. I mean, she there there was just nothing she wouldn't strike, or it was she'd strike everything. You know, it's like foot stomps, knees to the thighs, dirty box. You know, punches, go for takedowns. You know, when the opportunity uh, presented itself, good stuff. I mean, it's just it's just really good stuff. That first round was hectic too. I mean, that was just. All over the place, standing. I was on the ground. Uh, Van Zant would always throw in with the armbar if she was on her back, so that was good on her part. Real flexible too. That's one thing you're, you're gonna notice from pretty much every straw weight. It's just like this crazy flexibility on the ground. Um, because she wouldn't. She didn't even have to like angle very much to get her leg over the face for the armbar. You know. <laughs> I mean that that's the thing. It was just kind of like she was just kind of in place, but the the flexibility is insane. She didn't have to move very much, uh, move at an angle too much to uh, try and lock in an armbar from her back. So yeah, great improvement from Van Zant. You know, uh, she can fight. Uh, Juliana Lima would be a good stylistic matchup for Van Zandt. Lima likes to clinch against the cage as well and work more of a grappling, grinding st style fight. I think that actually fits Van Zandt's game pretty well. Uh, so I'd like to say Juliana Jutai Lima versus uh, Van Zandt. Or just someone from the Ultimate Fighter 20 would work. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, with Curran, she can get Nina Ansaroff, Tina Ladamaki, who's coming off the loss um, against uh, Claudia Gandalia, or s just someone from uh, The Ultimate Fighter 20, because um, the season's going to be over in just a couple weeks, so in like two or, th two or three weeks, I think, it's going to be over, so you know, I just gave her someone from Ultimate Fighter 20 as well. And finally, Du Choi defeated Juan Manuel uh, Pug by uh, TKO. 18 seconds versus first round. Um, we might see, be seeing the next Korean zombie here, in a sense. He's not, like... He does take hits clean, but he doesn't, like, have that, like, plodding forward style that, like, the Korean zombie had, you know? Where he ate punches and gave some. Uh, and just had like crazy fights in that sense. He, he's actually a lot more technically sound. But uh, I think you'll see some uh, high action fights from Duhu Choi moving forward. With Puig. Uh, or Pug. Um, two losses in a row. Both knockout in the first round. I mean. Maybe he gets another chance in the UFC. Because he did change weight classes. Uh... Otherwise, I personally think he should probably get cut from the UFC. And with Duhu Choi, if you can give him more uh, type uh, action type of fighters, maybe not like a Max Holloway type, type yet, but maybe like an Alex White. I know Alex White fights Clay Collard, the winner of that versus Duhu Choi. Fireworks right there. Lucas Martin's Duhu Choi would be pretty cool too. Um, even though he's coming off a loss. You know, guys like that, though, uh, would have some great fight of the nights with Duhu Choi. So that's it for my post-fight analysis for UFC Fight Night 57. If you have any comments, just leave them below. And that's it for MMA for you. Thank you guys very much.